but it really is God who sees to our provision. God who sees to our provision. He's always seen that, but we didn't catch it. We didn't see it. Until we come to that mount, I will point out the mount. God had said to Abraham, that is the same mount that Jesus has sacrificed. And on that mount, as he went to sacrifice, not only was he able to see a ram that is caught in the ticket for him, for his son, but it is in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. It is in the place of surrender, it's in the place of sacrifice, it's in the place of worship, it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh comes out in full play when it's a surrendered life of sacrifice and worship. Yahweh Jireh becomes personal to us. It was what would be theory, teaching, doctrine. Earlier, when we started it, it came to pass after these things. Now it's come to pass that duties, uh, that the uh, doctrines have become duties, creeds, now has something completeness. And so we realize how important it is. And it shall be seen. That is powerful, and we must be able to recognize there's no greater life than this life called sacrifice, surrender, and worship. Our eyes, our ears are opened to all that God has for us, otherwise which were closed and blind and could not hear. You know, if you could talk about what would be, in a way, the best way to describe, let's go back to, Genesis, to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. Here is almost God beseeching, almost so oh, graciously in such humility, not coercing and commanding and there's a difference between religion that is forced upon you and a faith that you do out of love for God. I beseech you, because of the mercies of Jesus Christ, that you present your bodies, spirit, soul, body, mind, emotions, everything put together on that mount, which is holy sacrifice, which is acceptable sacrifice, which is the rational, the most reasonable service or worship that you could ever do. Without that, worship is not a worship. Without surrendering, that sacrifice is no sacrifice. But when you learn what it is to surrender, in honey, here am I, a life of humility, then can you see the ram, the provision, that was always there, that you were never able to see. And then what can you recognize and uh, experience what God was always, Jehovah Jireh. But now it becomes poignant, it becomes practical in your life because surrender, sacrifice, worship is involved. It's important for us to realize this, and the only way I could bring a beautiful analogy is by giving you a negative. And with the negative, I want to draw out a positive to make us realize how important and what it means to surrender. Surrender has a bad coinage. It has a bad uh, reputation. It simply is, you're going to be killed if, I, if you don't surrender. Give me your wallet. I've got a gun behind you. Oh, take it. That's not what it is in reality, in the, in the, in the life of faith, uh, in the Christian faith. It's very important for us to realize, but let me just give you a negative, then for us to realize, oh my God, a man of all in person and yet a bellum all in person who wants the best for us. Let's talk about a negative. It is to do with what would be a king by the name of Rahab. You remember Rahab and his wicked wife Jezebel? They're both wicked. They are the, he's the king of north, which is the capital is Samaria. 
And of course, there were good prophets like Elisha and before him, Elijah. But that was a northern tribe walking away from God as opposed to Jerusalem or Judah, the capital of Jerusalem. But what I want you to recognize is through this real life incidents of what King Ahab, a very wicked king and a very fierce king, a person who really enjoyed killing, and you can read about it, if it was not for Obadai reaching out and uh, covering up some of the people, he would have killed the prophets. But this king Ahab met his match with someone higher and bigger and greater than him. Someone that demanded full and complete surrender from Ahab. And Ahab is a man of authority, but he also recognizes authority. But before that, let me give you an analogy of this Benadad. He's fierce, he's dangerous, he's totally volatile, and he's so moody, capricious, and he is what you would call a sovereign with such hate. Villages he would burn down and pillage and rape and burn them totally with the people was so full of fierce anger, his reputation. He had an army that was fierce. They loved slaughtering from the innocent child all the way to the mothers in their belly and the, and the child in the belly. And he would love to humiliate men and chop them to pieces. That is Benadad for you. But a little story would help. You know, Alexander the Great was one of the greatest uh, leader, military leader. Think about it, died at 33, so you can understand what a young age he began to conquer the then known and beyond the then known world. He really was called Alexander the Great, and he, was, he had men fighting for spheres with him. He conquered army after army, nations after nations, until he came to this place where he would send an emissary and say, surrender. To one man, he drew a circle and said, if you step out of this circle, you are killed. Make up your mind before you step out of the circle. But to this person in the East, he had conquered Persia. That was the great Persian empire. And now comes to India and he comes and gives them a message, surrender. The emissary came back and said, my king says, why should we? We know the terrain, we know this place, our people know the in and out, we basically know how to do fight, we have a fighting force bigger than yours, and we also know every hills and valley and ravines and also the trees by which we fight. You are no match, you're not used to what we are used to. And then, it doesn't matter how advanced your army is, we heard about them, you don't have what we have, we have elephants. They will trample your men and your horses under their feet. So Alexander, it says, said to the emissary, just you watch. He gave the command to his men, march. And they were up on the ravines, and they kept marching until the first rank of people fell off to their death. And the emissary stop. And Alexander said, stop. And the men basically, right at the precipice of this place, stopped. And the emissary of the king said, I can speak for the king. We're no match to you. Your men are dedicated and totally surrendered to you. How could we fight? How could we ever fight with a force like that? You see, Bernadad had fierce fighting force. So let's go to the story of, of King Ahab surrendering to Ben-Hadad of Assyria or Syria. If you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 20, reading from verse 1 to 4, listen to what it says here. And Benadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went and besides Samaria and warred against it. There were no match for Benadad. Verse 2, he sends his emissary, and he sent his messengers to Ahab, 
the king of Israel into the city and said, Thus said Benadad. Listen to what he says in verse 3. Your silver and your gold is mine. Your wives also and your children, even the goodliest, are mine. What say you? You know us. You know our fighting men. You know what we do to cities after cities that have been conquered by us. It is in dust. What is your answer? Do you want to surrender? What is the answer of this wicked King Ahab who has a fighting force, who is also cruel? But you'll be surprised by his answer. And I pray that be not negative, but that be positive, because I will come to the end of the third session with this. May this be our prayer to the most magnificent, almighty God. What was his answer in verse 4? And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine, and all I have is thine. Did you catch what he said? My lord, O king, all that you said, I accept. All that you said, I accept. I am yours, do as you will. My wives, my gold, my silver is yours. You are the stronger man. You are a bigger match than me. I bow down. I acknowledge you. I sacrifice myself. I cannot outnumber. I cannot defeat you. I cannot conquer you. You are the conqueror. Just in case his men didn't understand, here is what he now breaks it down to the elders of Israel. And again, it's a beautiful paraphrase of what he just said. O oh Lord, O oh King, my King, according to your saying, I am thine, and all that I have is thine. Now he's telling to the elders in the same chapter and verse 7. Listen carefully. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray thee, see how this man seeketh mischief. He is looking for my surrender mischievously, criminally, doing damage to me and to you, to our wives, to our children. But listen to what he says. For he sent unto me for my wives and my children, and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. The men must have said, which one of your wives? Hope it's not your favorite wife, everyone, including the favorite wife. Which one of your sons? I hope it is not Tom. No, it is Tom, Dick, and Addy, and every one of them. They're all going to be whatever Benadad wants. Which part of gold? Gold, everything. I'm going to open up the treasures. Everything I have is his. Which part of the silver? Are you going to hide something? I will show him everything I've hid because he is the conqueror. I have bowed down to him. He is in total, absolute control. Now, I want you to realize this is by force. If you don't do it, I'm going to stick you up in a pole and leave you there for days, long after you're dead. I'm going to crush out the bowels of your wives and disfigure them and humiliate them. And then you're going to hate that. I'll do it in front of you. I'll gorge out the eyes of your children by force and not out of volition. He was forced to surrender. Armies fight. And there is what would be a sense of what would be the consequences of a loss and what would it imply that would happen after a loss. I want you to understand the word surrender, the way if you look at any dictionaries, it's simply yield, concede, seed. It simply means submit, submission, utter submission. 
The word simply surrender means to give in, to give up, give for. It simply means what would be relinquish, withdraw, abandon. It simply is whatever you do, we are lifting up our hands in total surrender with a white flag. We have nothing. We do not resist. We are unarmed. We are totally at your mercy. We are forced to. There's no other way. That is the wrong submission. That is the wrong surrender by force. Speaking in unison because you are forced to, that is wrong. And many, whether it be in a country with a king that demands total, absolute control or religious figures that makes you do things, whatever they promise you, you are doing like crazy fool because you're afraid, that is submission wrong. That is surrender wrong. But what the Bible talks about is simply that you willingly present your bodies, not because you're going to be killed or slaughtered, because it is out of love. It is because what he has done for you, he's the great, he's the almighty, he is the most magnificent, awesome, wonderful God. You are doing it willingly from the very bottom of your heart. It's what you're doing with your own single-mindedness, not because you're false, because you want to, because of what and how much he loved you. You want to love him back. And there's nothing that you'd hold back because you do it out of love. So what do you do? in sacrifice, in giving, it's because of your love. But I'm going to tell you the most important thing is when you do out of submission, out of force, a submission because you are forced to do, the thief will basically knock you down, take away your pen, take away your money, and then bleed, make you bleed to death. But this, on the contrary, what God has called us to press in it is for our good. It's not negative. It's the most positive thing that you could ever find. And many Christians don't understand the joy of surrendered life, the joy of sacrifice, and the joy of worship. It all amounts to interchangeably the same. It's going to bless us. It's going to open our eyes and understanding, be enlarged so you can understand, oh my God, this is amazing. I thought I'm losing. On the contrary, I have gained. Go ahead, give the Lord a clap offering. The word surrendered is not in the Bible per se. I looked in the concordance, not in the King James Version. But the very strength of more than what surrender is in the Bible, and always in the Bible, submitting yourself to God yielding yourself to God, you can find that over and over and over and over again in the Bible. So when you take something like James chapter 4 and verse 7, we got it wrong. We sometimes think submit to the devil and resist God. A lot of people are resisting God. Oh, I can't do this. I can't give to God. I can't worship God. I can't do this. Sunday has to be my own. I have to wash the car. Oh, oh you know what? I, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. But submitting yourself to the devil, no, it's this way. Submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you submit to God, God will draw nigh to you. God will come with a blessing. When you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Don't submit to the devil. Submit to God. Don't resist God, but resist the devil. The word yield is a very strong language, stronger than the word that you can find, surrender. And this word is all the way in the New Testament and the Old Testament. But in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, to whom you yield yourself, servant to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, you can yield yourself to death, or obedience unto life and righteousness. And the Bible has so much to do about yielding. 
began in the Garden of Eden and the consequences of yielding to the wrong force and yet yielding to God unto righteousness, unto life through Jesus, what a vista opens when we understand yielding and submitting to the Lord. The passage I want to talk about, the next we won't have time, is a very important passage after Abraham is Joseph. Interestingly, Joseph, uh, uh, Jacob is a very interesting character. His name simply means trickster, corn artist, someone who's a deceiver. All of this is in his name, and so he is, beginning from his birth and all the way trying to grab his brother's blessings. But I want to basically us to turn to chapter 32 of the book of Genesis, and this is interesting because it is something about Jacob. You remember he is now running away from God for the 20 years. His father asked him, What's your name? He pretended to be Esau. He smelled like Esau. He made a uh, basically cloth like Esau. He even tried to frame his voice like Esau. He smelled like Esau. He sounded like Esau. And he basically looked like Esau, but he was anything but Esau. He was the plain old Jacob, a supplanter, a cheat. Uh, all of this. Now he's running away for his precious life. And now hot on his heels is his brother Esau with 400 of the special force, the crack division, that is basically running after Jacob. Jacob is the end of his wits, and you will do anything when you're at the end of the wits. Let me just tell you one of the things he did. That is found in chapter 32 and verse, uh, uh, I believe it could be verse 20. It says here, in chapter 31, and verse 30, he said, Yea, moreover, behold, your servant Jacob is behind you, for I will appease him with the present that goes before him. So what I'm going to do is I'm using my ingenuity, my cunningness, and all of this that I'm a trickster, a deceiver. I'm going to use that tricks. You see, my friend, yeah, Jacob was born again in the Old Testament standard. He was filled with the Spirit in the Old Testament standard. There's something about this kid. He was never submissive. He was never surrendered. There's a lot of Christians who are born again and speak in tongues and jump upa hula. And one thing about them, they have no submissive spirit. What? You telling me? You talking to me? Really? That is tragic. They've never learned what it is to have a surrendered life. They have gone through what would the red. See, they have gone through Jordan, but they have never gone through a place called Jabbok. I will explain it in just a moment. This is a camouflage. This is something he calls it, and listen to it, he calls it appeasement. Appeasement is a false surrender. You got a white flag, but you also have a gun behind your right hand. Yay! I surrender, I surrender. Ring the bell, appease the gods. Throw in some bribe, appease the gods, appease that enemy. Do something, whatever, as long as I can run out of the situation through a term of appeasement. Appeasement is nothing but a bribe. Appeasement is something like ringing a bell, walking on your bended knees and hoping that God will love you for what you have done, but neglecting what God has done for you. So this term of appeasement is a, is a term basically used to deceive. And there's a lot of people Sunday after Sunday and Monday through Sunday will do an appeasement to God. Even though they're at war with God, they pretend to be very close to God because they use the jargon, the Christian way of talking. How are you? Bless the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Blah, 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 blah. I'm fine. All along, they have a conniving, though born again, spirit filled, it's dangerous. But listen to what? In history, you can see a lot of war and a lot of appeasement. Do you remember the Tro uh, Trojan horse? The Trojan horse was simply the Greeks wanted to conquer Troy, but they couldn't. Troy, apart from the fact they're a good force, they had a fortified place. Uh, 
It was so fortified. The castle was so fortified. They had all the containments, the water, the food, all of this. And the Greeks, though they had a tremendous army, knew that they would be worn out with all of the passing summer and winter, and they would be outside with no water. They just couldn't get in. Because Troy was totally, completely fortified, and these men were inside laughing all the way. You want to come in and get us? Come on, try. Try like a, like a little monkey. Come up, and we'll show you what it is. And they got fed up until they devised this plan, and they made this Troy horse, and they put it up in front of the gate, and the people of Troy said, they are making an appeasement. They're making an appeasement to our goddess Diana. And so what the Greeks did was they took their ship and sailed out only to come back that night, back again. Very interesting, that very night, the Troy horse was taken into, um, Trojan horse was taken into Troy, and the Greeks came out, a few that were hiding inside, opened the gates, and before you know it, armed forces of the Greeks got in and took over. The whole idea of appeasement was just a temporary thing to appease, but not really genuine. And here is uh, Jacob making an appeasement. It's no genuine heart. There's no genuine spirit. It's walking down the aisles, write my names. Yes, are you saying, yeah, 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 I'm saved. Repeat after me, I'm saved, I'm saved. Nothing from the spirit. It's all manufactured. It's all manipulated. Really nothing. Until Jacob realized, I don't think this is going to work. And something takes place at this point when you turn to verse 22 of chapter 32 of Genesis. It says, and he rose up that night. He couldn't sleep. He had lived by trickery. He had lived by all sorts of conniving, conniving ways, but he realized this is not going to work. He realized he's not alone, but he's got his wives and his children and a lot of things to lose. And so you find he took his two women, his wives and two women, servants and his 11 sons, and passed over the ford of Jabbok. Pass over. He had to cross over. He had to do it himself. And this is a crossover, pass over. It simply is something that, number one, we need to understand, if we have to be surrendered, we have to move from one area to the other. Repentance is moving from one form of thinking to the other thinking. Our mindset from one, the old, to the new. And understand is something that no one can force you, no, can, no one can put words into your mouth. It must come from within. When you go to the next verse, you can get it very clear in verse 23. And he took them and sent them over to the brook and sent over that he had. And then in verse 24 comes the number two. Japok is not only the Passover. There is the Red Sea, that's a Passover. Speaks about salvation during the time of Moses. There's the Jordan River that speaks about water baptism during the time of uh, Joshua. Now in the time of Jacob, it is what would be the Passover or the crossing of the ford of this place, Jabok. Jabok is the most important point for a Christian life. A place willing to go alone with God and surrender. And number two, in verse 24, you can read that. Jacob was left alone. Mama can't do that for you. Pastor can't do that for you. Somebody else cannot ring the bell for you. You have to go alone to meet your maker. You have to go up and meet God. You have to make your peace with God. It's not about going up to the church. It is going up to God in a person to person and say, Lord, I can't do without you. I'm doomed. I'm dead. I'm finished. I cannot take life for granted. It is serious. And Jabok is that serious place of I lay down my life to you, Lord. But do you know what happens in Jabok? There wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Jabok is the place where you wrestle with God. Wrestle with God not to win but to lose. Jacob didn't realize that, so he was wrestling until the dawn of the crack of the next day. He kept on wrestling with God. He did not know what it is to submit to God, but he knew what it is to resist God until that piece of bone was broken, the hollow of his feet, that steadfastness bone that keeps us like stiff neck has to be broken.
It can come by force, it can get by circumstances, it can, can come like Esau pursuing. No matter what it would be, this Jabbok can be for some addiction that needs to be broken. You've gone here, you played around here, you did this, you did that. It could be lies, it could be worry, it could be fretting, it could be uh, a moral issue, it could be any issue. You have a real problem. You're alcoholic. Oh no, it's a social drinking. Is that the reason why you got thrown out of the job? Social drinking? No, that was my boss's fault. He was there at the wrong place at the wrong time and saw me crazy. Really? Rather than admit, yes, I'm an alcoholic. Social drinking. It sounds pretty nice. You know, when you sin, they say sin princely, wonderfully. There's a sense of uh, status quo. Don't say, I sinned. I made a little mistake. I, oops, I did it again. Yep, I did it again. So we need to recognize what it is. It was in the breaking of the day. And number one, Jabok. Number two, alone with God, wrestling. And God is wrestling to break that bone that is stiff-necked in us. Yeah, we are born again. We're spirit-filled. That submissive is not part of our rule. We are in every way stiff-necked. We will never submit. We don't know what it is to surrender. We know what others have to surrender. We're growing like that. That's why a lot of battles in the political world. That's why there's a lot of battles in the army. That's why there's battle in the spouse and the family and the children with their fathers. A sense of stubbornness that needs to be broken. Oh, they're all born again. They're all speaking in tongues. They go to church. They carry a big Bible, but stubborn like a mule. When you look at this, God loved Jacob. God wants the best for Jacob, and God is teaching him the wonderful aspect of surrendered life, the blessedness which his grandfather knew of surrendered life. And so when you go to this alone with God, and what is so amazing is something has to break. And Jacob's leg, the hollow as feet where he could stand, God broke, he had to be dependent on God. There are times God has to take things that made you independent of God. I can do all things. It's my job, it's my greatness, it's my outlook, it's everything go boom. And you say, God, I need you. I need Life begins when you surrender to God and much better than when you had a bone all the way there. Family life changes, the home changes, the children change when we learn what it is, the surrendered life. But let me just tell you the most amazing thing as you go down into verse uh, 25. Uh, he prevailed not, and he touched the hollow, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh went out of whack as he wrestled with him. Now when you turn to verse 26. He said, let me go, for the day is breaking, and I... Can I, I will not let you go, the angel said, except, he said, except you bless me. I will not let you go. When you turn to verse 27 is the place of surrender. Listen carefully to this. And he asked, the Lord asked him, what is your name? You can camouflage yourself. You can cover yourself. You can put that saintly little face. You can put all the oil and bucket of oil and speak in tongues and say, praise the Lord, the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, who oh, amen, amen, amen. But God is saying, what's your name? Who are you really? I'm Esau. 20 long years I've been a pretender. 20 long years I've been a deceiver. 20 long years I'm a con artist. I am not submitted or submissive to anyone, not even God. I resist, that's me. God said, what's your name? I'm Jacob. I can't go through this pretense. This is who I am. God, I surrender myself. I lay it down. I'm none other than old Jacob. And I want you to understand the most important thing that comes out of this mount of sacrifice, the mount of surrender, things suddenly change because it changed at the cross. You see, my friend, you can never have a crown 
without a cross. The cross is the reason why there's a crown. Without a cross, what you will be wearing is a Burger King's little crown. You like it, you can have it, it's free. Most likely, you don't even have to buy a burger, they'll give you a crown. They did that one time to me when I took my children. Here is the crown for your children. Hey, whoopee paree. You can have that for all you want, you can get 20 of that. It's worthless piece of paper. But I want, oh, it's good. Don't let the burger king sue me. This is America. <laughs> All right. That being said, listen to this, very important. When you turn to verse 28, look what happens. And I'm going to close. The choir is coming in just a moment. God said, your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel. No, no, no. It ends here. At this mount of sacrifice, you will no more be called Jacob, the old crafty, the old bone-headed person, stiff-necked person. You will be Israel, a prince with God, and with God and men you have prevailed. Hold it just a second. All along, I could never prevail because of my stubbornness, even though I was born again, and even though I spoke in tongues, and even though I'm a Christian, even though I carried the big Bible, why? Because of my bone-headed, stiff-necked life. And suddenly I'm realizing the moment I surrender to God, the blessedness of surrender. The blessedness of surrender. The first thing is you're Israel, you're a prince with God. Did you know that when you live a surrendered life, when you go to God, God says, you are a prince. The moment we are not surrendered, and he calls this man Jacob, you old corn artist. I mean, you should be Israel by now, isn't it? We don't have power. We have no influence. Our prayers don't even matter because God says, here he goes with this monkey business of prayer. He's walking down, he's jumping, the monkey business all over again. When will he really surrender? But God is saying, you are a prince with God. Not only you have influence when you come to me with your prayer, when you come in the need for someone else, speak to me. You are a prince with me. You are a prince for me. We are prince and princes with God only when we live a surrendered life. And with men you have prevailed. Born again, spirited, spirit-filled, educated, amazingly wonderful Wonderful in many ways, but never got a promotion. Never able to get an increment. Never able to make it to the top. Do you know why? You look up to the boss and say, what? You talking to me? No wonder you got kicked out of the job. It's a 24-year-old cop. May not be educated like you are. You are a PhD. Who are you? You know I pay your tax, my tax pays your bill. Who are you? Let me write you one paper and talk. You keep saying, let me write you another piece of ticket for you. When you go to the court, when you go to the police officer, he's called officer, but you know what? Say, your honor, I'm so sorry. Just as fast you came, just as fast you leave. No trouble, no problem. Why? Because you learned what is to be submissive. I never will be submissive. Then make your day, every day in court. Every day with your work, Lord. But the most important thing is surrendered life, not only with God, but with men you have prevailed. It will not come without surrender. We surrender to the Lord, amen. It all belongs to him. Praise the Lord. Lift your hands and just worship him all across the room. Lift up your voice and just begin to worship him from your own mouth. Father, we are in this. We are in this.
And total surrender is simply saying, my spirit, my soul, my body, my emotions, my mind, my everything, Lord, my King, belongs to you. All that I am, all that is mine, it's yours. I bend to you. You are the one I yield my life to. I'm so glad that you were able to be with us. And those that are watching, thank you for being with us today. And it's a great joy that you took part in the worship today. And you can still keep watching, whether it's the YouTube or whether it's the, the FB or whether it be in the internet or television. We're so glad that you came our way. Until next time, God be with you. God, ble God bless you. Thank you once again. Amen. Just for a moment.